So when we talk about apps for good, I, I, I thought I'd start with some apps that I like. Everyone's got their smartphones. It's so funny in doing this talk for several years. Everyone has a smartphone? Everyone has a favorite app? What's a favorite app? What have you used in the last 24 hours? Evernote. Oh, good. Evernote. Absolutely. Great way of capturing all your ideas together. What else? Trailer. Trailer. Oh, the trailer. I have just discovered a fantastic app. Oh, we just absolutely use it. Yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> love it, Trailer. Anything else? Spotify. Oh, Spotify. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's what I listened to all the way up yeah. on the train, so I had my music, etc. Shazam. Oh, Shazam. First time Shazam came out, it was like magic, wasn't it? It was just one of those wow characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so let me talk to you about just three apps that I quite like at the moment. One of them is it takes as its premise, because any good app is trying to solve a problem. So the, this app takes as its premise, of course, none of you but there are out there adults who don't necessarily keep their promises to teenagers, okay? Not you, of course. You, of course, would keep every promise that you've ever made a teenager in a timely fashion. But out there, there are some adults who sometimes forget the promises they've made, the agreements they've had with teenagers. This is an app that allows two people to make a promise. It's mostly designed for teenagers and adults. Once they've agreed what that agreement is, and the time frames, it then sends you reminders. And then when the uh, promise is kept, it reminds you of the reward or possibly the sanction that was attached to that. That's Promise Keeper. Another one's Beat the Book. Um, a number of students have often reported, if you're someone who doesn't like reading and who's uncomfortable with reading, an English classroom is a really uncomfortable place to be because having questions asked of you can be very embarrassing, but even more importantly, asking questions of the teacher is a very difficult one. This allows you to use the smartphone. The teacher can set questions on set text. The students can answer on their phones. And then more interestingly, the students can then start asking the teacher questions and monitor that via the smartphone. RMB Me takes as a premise, again around the teenage market, that there are lots of reminder programs out there, but they're mostly text-based. But many people learn in very different ways. And the idea of incorporating images, color, sound is a wonderful way of creating reminders, be it around exams, coursework, etc. Now, these three apps are apps that I do really enjoy. I have on my phone, but they're also apps that were designed here. Not by some young company of hungry 20, 30, 40 somethings, but actually students as young as 13 years old. When you're looking across those three app teams, these are apps for good graduates who entered our national competition after completing the course for a year, came up with a problem or issue and took it all the way through. In becoming winners, we combined them with an app team, a professional team that took their prototype to market so you can download that. I have six more apps that will be launched in January, again, from students as young as 12 years old, as old as 17. Um, one of the things I often say when I look up here now as well, because sometimes in the press they've been talking about the idea of apps, in the invention of apps is becoming more the purvey of private schools, isn't it? They're getting that sense that this is what private schools do. But the reason I've chosen these three of six is all three of these schools are actually schools that are working in deprived communities within the UK. Um, what you're looking at there without talking about student, student, specific students there are students who are on the social needs register, who have EAL issues, who are working within communities that are deprived. So they're breaking that stereotype. And lo and behold, dear Lord, there are girls. Yes, girls on the stage. And what would be pleased and in our stats year on year as we progress, we're now at about a half and half ratio. Half of our students are girls. And I was pleased then, in last year's finals, last June, that amongst our finalist teams, 68% of them were girls. All right, so boys, do watch out. The girls are coming once they have that interest. And you do see some of the other stereotypes that are broken, um, being broken in apps for good. Quite often, we look within the tech industry, it has a very low representation um, from the ethnic minorities. This is something that we look across not deliberately, but what's coming through is that diversity when we're letting young people understand about apps for good. All right, when we talk about apps for good, part of it is about building, it is about coding, but it is much bigger than that because what we believe that the tech industry needs, but actually that the wider society needs, is a generation of problem solvers and makers. Any good dev will tell you that the greatest devs are people who solve problems, who stick at that. And if we look at what we need in society, and too often what we're not producing through education, 
are those problem solvers who they can create, they can launch, and they can market new um, apps and ideas that can change their world. So when we've had this, we're actually in a transition. Apps for Good's really been going only for about four years now. We started out by just delivering a course. We have a number of people as it has sort of gone through what we call hyper growth, and um, people have started to suggest it's becoming a movement. And the reason it's gone from course to movement is the people who are part of it, whether it be our students, our teachers, our experts, or our companies who sponsor us, they're not just doing the course. They're actually going out and recruiting on our behalf. They're coming up with new ideas. We have time and again people taking this the extra length. And because there was this passion that in actually teaching young people, helping young people see that they can solve their own problems and then they can build their own solutions, it's really transforming things, not just within the tech industry, but within education wide. So what I often say to teachers is, do you remember why you went into education? What first got you there? And it wasn't knowing that your kids were going to get a certain mark on an exam paper. It wasn't knowing that you were going to tick a certain box on a curriculum model. It was for that making a real difference for young people. And that's really what Apps for Good is about. So how do we do it? Apps for Good, in and of itself, takes young people. It puts them in teams of three to five. It moves away from the individual model. And it lets them choose a problem or issue. That's really important. They choose the problem issue, not the school, not our sponsors, not some annual competition that we set one theme. They can choose anything that they care about. And then we take them through the whole of the app design process that goes from problem all the way through prototype. It is based on the lean approach. We're using the latest thinking in terms of both not just tools, but also approaches within the um, tech sector. It is focusing increasingly year on year on the coding, but what we think brings it to life for young people is it's coding for a purpose within a context. The young people will do those rather tough things in coding because it's about building something they care about. And what we do throughout is we build it and it's linked to a real life context, real life experts, and they get that to go out to create. Their goal is to take something that really goes out on that app market that they can see that they belong, that it belongs to them. So you can see how we take that through. Um, what it translates into is we have a course. The course is really quite a flexible framework. Some schools deliver it, some clubs deliver it in as little as 30 hours. Some want to go much deeper, spend as long as 50 hours. We found that some do it as extracurricular clubs, both within schools and community centers. Some are doing it through a series of master classes. One of the schools, Calder Glen, here in Scotland, um, um, in Glasgow, does it as a series of master classes. Others do it within the curriculum. Our school up in WIT did this within their curriculum time, part of the classroom experience to take them through. You can see what we do. We've broken it down into five simple units. It's a crash course that gives them an overview. How in industry people, do people go from a problem all the way through to a product or prototype? We take them through idea generation, screening and scoping. That screening and scoping involves technical feasibility, not just the market research, and into product development. They are building and testing from wireframes through to prototypes of their idea. We then at the end run our own Dragon's Den, a pitching competition. The young people are given the opportunity to enter their app ideas. We have six categories. We also have now this year a technical category and we have the People's Choice Award that happens. The young people enter into those categories. We bring the finalists down to London. We brought them down. I had to bring down three, not one, but three teams from WIC down to London. Mm -hmm. That's no small logistical feat, but we got them all there. Um, they pitch in front of an expert panel. This expert panel can include VPs, CEOs, CTOs from a number of very big industries as well as devs from little tiny dev companies in and around Tech London. From that, they then open a marketplace where they had 200 people walk around while the young people pitched their idea and showed their prototypes to the audience. The audience could then vote on an idea. We had an app to do that. Some young entrepreneurial soul leaked it, so it went out on social media that night, so we had to open it up completely. Um, then we bring them down into a main auditorium. They have to do an elevator pitch in front of 250 people, and one team from each of the categories then goes to market. 
I'm also pleased to say this year, one of our teams that didn't win, because we always say no one person has the answer, one of our, sponsor, one of our um, experts has a dev company so liked their idea, he's then worked, gone into contract with them to take their app to market. So more and more, we'll start seeing that if they have the idea, they don't have to wait for us to tell them to go ahead, they can carry on from there. Okay, so it's a course. What is it, what makes a difference? When we talk about apps for good, I'm talking about something that brings together rather different communities and to work together to develop these app ideas. We do have our educators in schools, we do work with teachers, as opposed to some organizations where they bring outside, we have teachers working alongside our tech experts. Now our experts now, we're at 500, they're across the country in the UK, but we also now have techs who are wanting to Skype in to mentor our teams from Spain, from America, from Italy, from Portugal. It's growing wider and wider. Our experts volunteer their time. What they do is across the course, there's at least five opportunities where they can come in virtually or in person to work with the app teams, to listen to their ideas and to offer them guidance and advice on how they can improve and increase their chances. We have our students and alumni who then, once they graduate, go on to help other students, other teams, and do, go on to learn more about coding themselves. And we have our sponsors. That list grows year on year as we have those sponsors. You know, in case you're cynical, um, the, uh, the sponsors themselves are in it because they do understand that there is a gap in the talent pipeline. Young people are not coming to them with the skills they need, and they're also opting out long before they can get those skills. They have volunteers. A lot of people within the tech industry do want to do volunteering, and they're not so keen to go out and paint a fence. They'd much rather use the skills that they actually have to work with young people. Um, they also have had a fantastic idea. You know, they love seeing what the youth market comes up with. But here's where the cynical. Then the teachers immediately ask, so who, who owns the apps when they finish it? No, our sponsors are very clear. The young people own that all the way through. They're not in it for a profit sharing model. Um, so how do we work with our teachers? Um, now, somehow when it's squished, I'm an English teacher and that little bit troubles my soul that somehow that happened. I do know how to spell individual. But what we're saying is there's a shift too often within the classroom and quite often within the technology classroom. We've lapsed into that sage from the stage, the educator at the front giving all the knowledge to the young people. And if you're actually within tech, that's a really hard place for a teacher to be. How can you possibly keep up to date with all that is changing within computing, within technology. What we use is we call the rock climbing analogy. The idea is this, the young people are gonna be making their way up as teams at different paces. Some teams find it pretty straightforward and go up very easily. Others struggle, have to come back down. And as for good, we're not afraid to let them fail, to reach debt problems, to have to start and think again and pivot their idea. What the teacher does, that doesn't mean the teacher goes off and hides in the staff room and can have their cup of coffee. I'm afraid I still need you there because we have you down as the coach. You're there making sure they have the safety equipment. You're shouting up that pedagogical expertise. You're asking the right questions, not giving the answers, and certainly not doing it for them. But what we also add is remember those experts that I have. The experts work alongside as well. They're providing that technology expertise. What's happening? What's the latest R&D? What's happening within hardware? Are there new algorithms that might really change that? Are there other prototypes? Are there other products of the market that they might look at? So this combination is really one of the things that really brings apps to good for life. And one of the things our teachers say works most excitingly. The young people really enjoy working with those outside experts. And the teachers themselves also find that they're really benefiting and it's refreshing their own professional knowledge as they go through the course. Um, so what do our experts do? Now, you know, broadly the experts are there to inspire. They're there to offer feedback, direction on the project, to mentor those teams. They're also there to talk what, that, uh, what it's like to be in the tech industry. A lot of our experts are very good at, at exploding that myth that kids have that uh, to go into technology is just to sit in the basement with the smelly basement with the guys who are eating pizza, something like off the IT crowd. What they do show is that much greater range of what's there. They offer expertise in a whole range of things. It can be everything from UI to technical feasibility, but also things like the business model. How do you make a great pitch? That whole range of things. If you think of the sort of expertise that young people can then draw on, it's quite a powerful part of the program. 
and the tools. Each year that we've operated this program, we've gone deeper into the tech and the building. That's one, because we're gathering more help from our experts to build in. Two, I'd suggest that more and more there are tools that are coming that have increasing sophistication, yet are pretty easy for students to learn. We also find that schools are at different phases. For some of our schools, for some of our primary schools, where teachers are really just dipping their toe in the water, they might want to start and start showing their students really simple tools, things like Balsana. Something that you can learn in about 20 minutes and teach kids in 10. That's a simple wireframing tool. We then go on to slightly more complicated tools. A lot of schools in England have been using Scratch. Well, if you use Scratch, App Inventor was a nice step on that the drag and drop to help them build for the smartphone apps. AppShed, really pleased with that because it has it's more technically complicated but more resilient on school networks because we found App Inventor was making some teachers' head explode. Um, but we're also finding that some of our students and some of our teachers are getting more and more excited about using meatier tools, as well as things like CSS, JavaScript, HTML5. Some of our schools are wanting to even start using some of the, the Facebook API. We're in an agreement with Facebook where their engineers are helping teach how to use and develop social apps. We're using things like JSBed. So there's a whole range. What we say to our teachers is this. It's again not about being the expert at the front. It is about understanding a range of tools, understanding how you can teach your students to start on those tutorials, and then back to that rock climbing analogy, climb themselves, start finding their way, the way a lot of devs do about trying to learn the tools, look at the tutorials, etc., and helping each other. And that's part of how the building goes on. So when we talk about apps for good, um, we're talking about a real shift within the classroom. It's moving from that individual performance into working as a team, as often happens in industry. It's not just being taught, but it's actually working with experts. Our experts are very carefully coached to make sure that they ask questions, don't give answers. That they work with the young people and help them find their own way through that. From taking a test or an exam or to testing that solution with others, it's also about from learning an answer to designing a solution. We're growing. Um, what we do, if you think back in 2010, we first started, it was two centres in London. One was a community centre, one was a girls' school in Tower Hamlets. As of this September, we've reached 20,000 students. We're in 225 schools. We've gone from having three educators to 450. That means we're going to probably have around 5,000 app ideas going on across the UK. You can see where we've grown. Um, and you can see why I really want to try and develop more importantly. So starting just here, we now have quite a lot of coverage across just England. We're starting to dip in Wales, Northern Ireland, and you can see where my, um, my specialists, including Sunny Wick, up at the top. Um, so what does that mean in Scotland? What I was really pleased is two years ago, I was contacted by two different Scottish schools. And at that point in time, I had to say, I know nothing about Scottish curriculum. We've not worked in Scotland at all. But what we did look at is the more we looked at the curriculum for excellence, and the more we came to understand how much expertise you already have in computer science within Scotland, we thought that was a really exciting opportunity. So what we do have is our existing schemes of work have been mapped against the, um, the curriculum for excellence. And from what I've had from my teachers, it maps across rather easily, and it also links into those wider issues of across curriculum. I don't think it was our fault, but two of our three schools that did the um, Apps for Good last year both had HMI inspections go on. Um, they actually were really pleased. In one school, Calder Glen, which is, is not far from here, um, they received one of the only grade ones for curriculum. And they were told that one of those reasons was the HMI inspector had come in and seen what they were doing apps for good. And as well as the cross-curricular link linking that was going on there, the links that it offered within industry and that real-world experience was what really impressed the HMI and they felt that was a really rich part of what, and one of the reasons why they felt it was a curriculum got a one within the school. WIC also had an inspection come in the spring last year, and what was interesting for there the HMI came in with a specific focus on creativity. And the inspector was so impressed by what was happening with Apps for Good Dip that, um, I think it was a she, often didn't associate the creativity with the computing science. And to see how that was coming through, they're going to be doing a deeper study on that and feedback with that further. 
So it's something that I'm, you know, I'm really pleased to see. And I actually, when I talk to my schools in England, there's a certain degree of envy. Um, as you know, computing science has had a much slower growth in, in England. And the um, curriculum from excellence, I do know that it brings challenges for you. But I have to say, a lot of my English schools look with longing to what's happening here and the way that you can look at, focus on things that we feel are much more meaningful. And that's for good felt. It's a much neater, easier fit with what we're doing here. Um, and then I have to say, it was over the moon. Given that, if you remember back, we only had three schools that were operating out of my 100 schools. So that's 3%. I feel like I should be dancing. We should go to a flash mob or something. This is the bit we all think. It's OK, I'll have a video clip too. Won't be quite a few times now. <laughs> Um, but in looking at that, so 3% of my students across the, the whole of the UK were Scottish. Um, when we ran our competition, we had four of our finalist teams that came down were from Scotland. And I have to say two of the winning teams were from WIC, okay, my little school all the way up in WIC. The two really different ideas. One of the teams was a girls team. Um, it was in the category about making the most of information and it's to do with dogs. Um, but the one that actually really has created quite a buzz, and it's one of the things I think because it's at the heart of what happens at Apps for Good, the student team has actually come up with an idea that the dev team that's putting them, working with them right now thinks may have international resonance. And it's an app idea that came about um, very, very differently. I, have, I happen to know, you know, the picture you see here, um, this rather scruffy man that looks as if he might be a roadie in a rock and roll band is actually um, the global head of technology for Thomson Reuters, it's Bob Shukai. So Bob Shukai is one of our most active and enthusiastic experts. And he had originally Skyped up to WIC, got very excited about the work that they were doing and asked would I go with him to visit WIC to go and see these students face to face, which was several train journeys, some flights, etc. but we went up there. And I actually remember, this was last October, and there was one team of boys in particular, um, they were monosyllabic. They said maybe six words while we were there. And they had an idea, because remember, they were talking about a problem or an issue that they care about. The, the boy I'm going to show you in a moment actually spoke, it's the, the biggest passion we had when he did it. And his problem was this. He was absolutely sick of having to run back and forth to the car or to the house to get his dad paper to write down information about the cattle, okay? So this is an app idea that is about an app, but it is absolutely grounded in the rural background that the students up at WIC experience. And I'll, I'll show you a clip of what they've done. And so this cattle management app is being developed. Um, the lads were brought all the way down from WIC. Um, during the morning when the teams come down, they spend the morning with one of the dev companies being hothouse. And what I found really amusing was the second day when I talked to the team, asking them how had the last two days gone, what was the best thing, what was the most interesting or exciting thing they'd had across the two days, thinking of all the things they'd done. The lad just interviewed in a minute talked about it was the first time when they spent lunch, it was the first time he'd ever had a burrito. So for him, that was the first international experience that was very, very important for him. Let's see if this will work. Let me show you the app and the boys' ideas. If they're boys' own words. Let's see if it works. It won't have exciting music, my friend. And I don't have any music at all. It's worked three times of practicing. While it's looking, she says, as she's trying to look and see if she wants to alt tap it. Um, the other thing I showed on there is this is something that was featured. And we're really pleased that Chris, the teacher that was behind this, um, has been named, and we'll find out on Tuesday, um, the Top Top Digital Hero Award for Scotland. Um, we're really pleased for Chris, and um, I'm going with him on Tuesday to the House of Commons to see if he gets the overarching. Hi, my name's Joan and I'm from WEC. Um, What's the name of your school? WEC High School. Tell us about your app idea. Hey, we're app ideas, farm management tool, so keep track of paperwork for cattle. 
sounds like a great idea. Uh, what what uh, led you to come up with the idea? Just because we're all farmers and it's like hard to keep track of paperwork, so it'd be handy or have on an app. We know how hard it is. Okay, so your families are, your families are farmers? Yeah, uh, And so uh, how, do they, how do they handle their paperwork at night? Well, we struggle on like everyone else. Okay, and how does this one help? These guys are so that she can give them do paperwork. It's all on uh, your phone. It's so when you can just send it to the department, see an inspector coming and pestering you. Wick Wick is in a remote part of Scotland. Uh, what would, t tell us what it's like compared to London. Well, it's a lot quieter. <laughs> it's all really nice and peaceful out there. Okay, and uh, what, have you, what have you learned from uh, being involved in Apps for Good? I've learned a bit more about computer work and uh, so, so, uh, that's it really, just computer and uh, computer programming. Uh, Great. All right. Well, lots of luck with the uh, competition. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, if you look at, for me, I'm, I'm an ex-teacher. I'm a mum. Um, I saw the journey of these lads. The lad they see, you see talking there, that was the lad who, of burrito fame. When I first saw him, it was monosyllabic. And Chris, the teacher, also talked quite passionately about how much these boys really didn't want to be in the class and didn't see the join up. But actually, they made huge progress within the class, not just in their computing skills, but actually in their confidence, in their worldview. And if my deaf teams are, are anywhere right, this is an app that when we've talked about it, some of our sister organizations are in places like Brazil, Venezuela, and um, there's real interest in using this sort of app. So you'll notice um, there's some links on our website. There was some blogging after the event, and there was one slightly tongue-in-cheek um, article that was talking about the changing face of computing in 20 years' time, talking about how women took over the tech world and how WIC, the WIC digital hub began <laughs> in the year 2013, and it all began very much here. So it is the kind of thing that I think that what we've seen is not just that this works within Scotland, but it actually works, you know, I didn't know when I first came up here and we started doing Apps for Good, the, the challenges of working in the highlands and islands might be. Um, physically getting up there, but also looking at how connected that school is now, in which the, you know, these kids now have first-hand experience. There's a girl now who's studying computing at university, and one of the reasons isn't just that she did it, she wasn't doing apps so good, she heard about it, she was that bit older, but she came along on the day, got very inspired by what Bob Shukai was doing. Bob, when he heard he was going on, she was going on to do computing, then not only did he help write and encourage her and email her about the course, he also got a work experience place at Thomson Reuters in Canary Wharf in the summer. So it does start moving across boundaries, and it does start connecting that world for young people and opening their eyes to the things that they can do while they're learning those computing skills. Right, so, and this is the boring bit, it's sort of where we are. It was great to come up and talk to you guys, um, and what I need to understand, we work on an annual schedule. So we begin our recruiting in the spring. From January, we open our um, uh, membership of applications. We do our training in the summer term for launch in September. The usual questions that I have so far, I've tried to capture here. My first question is people are always saying, okay, now, how much does this cost, Debbie? Okay, so the first thing I would say is, if you remember in that early slide, we do have corporate sponsorship, and we have a scheme now that also involves adopting schools. So what this means is for not, not private, non-fee paying schools, the program that we offer is free. All we ask that the schools do is that they commit to deliver the course in its entirety, that they will identify a lead educator and a senior member of the team who will deliver the course and be attached to the course, and that that lead educator, the school agrees to pay travel and cover induction training. We don't train you in London, this year's training was in Glasgow. All right? And as we see and expand across, we will always try and make those as close as possible. Um, partners do re receive the free induction training. You get access to our course materials and to our expert community via our online platform. We're also having growing video content available and webinars that our teachers can continue to take part in free of charge. The students from the partner schools and colleges are eligible to enter the annual competition. And like I say, those then named as finals are brought down to London for that. 
um, who knows if the train comes on, we might have to move that up to someone like Edinburgh, just so it costs us less in the long run to have the competition. Um, he what you think? Yeah. <laughs> Chris keeps saying he's happy to host anything. He was going to host the training, but everyone else has gone saying no. We're going to Glasgow. Thank you very much. I mean, it's lovely up there. Having been there, I'm all up for going for a while, but it, it will take a little more planning on our part as an organization. Um, winning teams do have their app prototypes developed by the professional devs and it's released on the market. Students will own these apps and all the related IP. Um, I have been asked that so far, you know, we've only been doing this for three years, the apps are free or largely free, but the contract does say that if they become rich, they get that money. We hope they remember us. At Apps for Good, we retain the IP in terms of using the materials, so you can see the sorts of things, and we share that back for our teachers. But the young people own it, so at the moment there are 16 apps out there owned, and you can check on the about screens that are owned by students as young as 12. Um, we were really pleased. The other thing we had last year was the first time we had primary schools. Again, this was just one primary school that originally when they stopped me last year, I said, we've never done primary school. I don't think we can. They were very, very keen. Bless them, only one primary school in my 100. They sent two teams to the finals. They didn't win, but everybody remembers them. And now these kids went away absolutely blasted, loving what they did experience there. So the primary schools, don't kid yourself, they can't do it. They really took to it really very, very easily. Um, then, let's see, so what that means is, what next? If you are interested or you know schools that are interested, you can go ahead and register interest. It's no commitment at this point. If you go on appsforgood.org, you can find out more about the course, some of the materials, the corporates involved, the app ideas. You, we have a mailing list just in terms of if people are interested in joining, they can put their name down, then we open registration, then you can get that. The registration, once you do that, all of the online application is, is relatively straightforward. It's not a lot of time. You can research, gather in for consult staff, and then from January, you can have an application going for, Jan for um, September 2014. Um, that's where we are. If there's any questions, I think I've kept us mostly to time. Yes? I'm just going to ask uh, Debbie, the, the primary school, what kind of tools did they use for the sort of prototype and, and what sort of things were they The using? primary school found that they used um, Balsamic and App Inventor. When I explained to them that App Inventor, App Inventor was really buggy, but they stuck with it. I have said to them that App Shed is, is more um, friendly. But they've said, by God, they've been nearly, if they made it through it the one time, they're going to do it again. There's an article on our website that they did for Teach Primer that's a really good one. They're quite a powerful story because the teacher, one of the teachers who, when the head teacher was keen and signed the year group up for doing it, one of the teachers that came on the training, when she came to us, did not have a smartphone or any apps at all. And now, confidently using a balsamic, some confidence in doing app inventor, and she's determined before it's all done that she's going to start using something like HTML5. Any other questions? Brilliant. Okay, I think I've finished with three minutes to spare. That gives you time to get down first in the queue for your coffee. Thanks very much, everyone.